Thanksgiving. I had a fantastic one. My mom and Jill's parents rode up together from Texas, not only to join us for Thanksgiving, but also uh, to be here for our daughter Maggie's baptism. So we were really excited about that on Monday night to have a small gathering of folks to witness that. And on Thanksgiving Day, we got to have our first communion together as a family. So that was really special. And then on Wednesday, Maggie Mae was also baptized. So it's just, it's wonderful to see our children coming to faith. And if that really has to be something we're excited about and what we're passionate about doing is passing on the most precious of stories on to the next generation. Let me ask you, uh, do you worry about things? A lot of us do. I mean, do you spend time fretting about stuff throughout the week? I, I know when Scripture it tells us it's not going to do us any good, and, uh, but yet sometimes we, we spend uh, minutes, sometimes hours, uh, worrying about our friends, our family, sometimes our finances, our future, and uh, after Friday, now we worry about getting pepper sprayed by fellow Black Friday shoppers. I, I mean, these are things we have to be consumed about. Do you spend time worrying about things? Do we spend time in anxiety about our relationship with God? Do you worry about your salvation? Because if you do, you're, you're not alone. And in fact, it's something that a lot of us have to wrestle with. Irma Bombeck tells a, a funny story, and it's kind of a classic piece on worry. She says, I've always worried a lot, and frankly, I'm good at it. I worry about introducing a group of people and going blank when I get to my mother. I worry about a shortage of ball bearings. I worry about the world ending at midnight and getting only three hours out of a 12-hour cold capsule. I worry about getting into the Guinness Book of World Records under pregnancy, world's oldest recorded birth. I wonder about what the dog thinks about me when he sees me getting out of the shower. I worry that my daughter will marry an Eskimo and set me adrift on an iceberg when I can no longer feed myself. I worry about the sales lady following me into the fitting room of oil slicks of Carol Channing going bald. Boy, this dates this illustration. And I worry about scientists discovering someday that lettuce has been fattening all along. Well, sometimes there, there are things that are trivial that, that we worry about. Uh, sometimes we'll be on vacation and we'll be several hundred miles away and Jill will go, I wonder if the garage door went all the way down. And so we're just, oh, I don't know. You know, maybe it's up and you know, people are pillaging the house. You know, and, and, and other times we, we worry about, is our, our company going to get the big government grant? We're going to get the, the, the big project we've been bidding on. And boy, our company needs that. So those are things that consume us. But all too often, as Christians, we're consumed by our relationship with God. Are we good? Are we good enough? You know, a lot of people worry about that. You know, I was uh, reading a blog this week, asked the question, why do Christians never seem to feel very good about themselves? One of the responses may shed some light on the problem. The person writes, the basic premise of Christianity is that there is nothing good in us. That original sin has ruined us. and We're miserable sinners, unworthy of anything good without the blood of Jesus. That depravity is our essence. And with that as our starting point, my experience has been that despite all the God loves me messages that I get tossed around in church services and Bible study, nothing completely fills the cracks of that deep chasm. That somehow, no matter what, we just aren't good we just aren't worthy. We aren't secure. We aren't lovable. We are fatally flawed as human beings. My experience in working with people in pain in the church is there's an awful lot of insecurity going around in a system that's supposed to be built upon freedom, upon healing, upon wholeness. Far too much fear, depression, inadequacy, and unworthiness exists in countless Christ followers when they have a chance to be really honest. Something is gravely wrong with this. Had an opportunity to go to the hospital several years ago to visit one of our members that was in the final throes of a terminal illness. When I walked into the room, I mean, you just kind of get a sense when you do hospital visits if someone is going to be able to leave and return home and those that you know will never. And so I, I figured that when you encounter a situation like that, they've had plenty of opportunity to talk with family about personal things. 
they've had time to talk with doctors about their medical condition and, and what comes next, but they need someone to be able to talk about their faith. And so this gentleman, I, he was in his late 70s, and I just asked him, I said, are you at peace spiritually? Are you good with God? And by the way, if I come by your, your hospital room and I ask you that, things are not going well, okay? But so I asked this gentleman, and I, I, he had been a, a, a believer since he was in his teens. And he had served as an elder for the church for the better part of three decades. So I was surprised by his answer. He said, boy, I sure hope so. I thought, if this man can't have confidence, is there anyone that have confidence in their faith? Well, if these sentiments seem to resonate with you today, I want to give you a, a, a true gift. We talk at, at Christmas time about peace and hope. This morning, I want us to talk about hope. I want to share with you the blessings of peace that resonate from our Heavenly Father. Last week, we talked uh, and looked at the passage in 2 Peter chapter 1. And as I was studying for that lesson, it came upon kind of a real jewel in 2 Peter 1 and verse 2. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to be all over Scripture. There's not a, a central passage. Because I want us to see this ongoing theme that God tries to develop through His prophets. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus. Or Jesus our Lord. So I, I got to... We talked about this last week that this knowledge is not a book knowledge. It's not just sitting down to, to learn more about scriptures. But this knowledge is a knowledge built on relationship. Like a husband and wife over many years of getting to know one another. There becomes this ease of, of relationship with God. He knows us and we know Him. And the more that we know God and the deeper we go in our relationship with Him, guess what? This, this grace begins to pour over. This peace begins to resonate within us. We see how God is truly blessing each one of us. Well, I got to look in, in, in Scripture, and every single one of the letters, except for Hebrews and James, begins with salutation and includes the blessing of peace. And I began to thinking, I don't think this was by chance, and I don't think it was just mere pleasantries before they got to the heart of, of the lesson. What was it that that John and Peter and Paul were trying to communicate. I think what they're trying to do is remind a, a, a fledgling church that's undergoing a lot of persecution around the various parts of the empire. We are a people at peace. We're not going to be defined by what's happening around us, but rather what we have in God. Remember what God is doing among us. We are a people at peace with God. Let that sink in. We are a people at peace with God. That's our identity. It's our calling card. Since the mention of peace is usually coupled with grace, I want to cover that first. Grace is a decision that God makes out of His generous heart to treat us better than what we deserve. Amen? It is born out of His good pleasure, totally unmerited by us, for our Heavenly Father to pull us up out of the trash heap and welcome us to come before the other saints, before the throne of glory. It's what God has done for us. God extends His good pleasure to delight in a people that do not deserve it. But guess what else happens because of this, uh, of this peace that we have? His rightful anger and our disobedience is a, is a peace, and we have peace with Him. So if we are celebrating this new peace that we have, well, it stands to reason that at some point we weren't at peace with God. If you go back and look at the original story of Genesis and the creation, Adam and Eve made their play for moral autonomy. They were banished from the garden. And so they, they were cast aside and they were put out. And in, in fact, as they go from there and the world starts populating, we see in Genesis chapter, chapter 6, the Lord said that He grieved making mankind. It wasn't working. They, they didn't have the same relationship that they had hoped for. He wanted to continue walking through the garden like He had with Adam and Eve. But that was not what was happening. And so we see in Genesis chapter 6, the Lord says, I, I'm going to reset. I'm going to grab one husband and wife and their three sons and their wives, and we're going to start over. We're going to try to do this one more time after the flood. As man began to pass over the earth, 
and to spread out, the Lord says, I want to choose one faithful man to start holy people, people set aside for myself. And so he chose Abram at the time, the father to be a, of the chosen people. Well, did that bring about harmony with God? Not exactly. Over the next hundred years, we see that God's faithful people would go through a cycle. And the cycle usually started like this, that God would bless them, and God would protect them, and God would do all kinds of things for his people. And after a period of time, they began to take that for granted. And so they turned to other things, turned to other idols, and they would add God plus some stuff. And then so sin would start increasing among God's people and so they would go through a cycle where they're experiencing the pain and the consequences of that sin. And when that got to be too much, they would cry out to God, Lord, please come help us. And so God would intervene and would bless his people once again. And so they would feel, man, we're right back into the God's good graces until they would step out and repeat the cycle over and over again. This continued on even into the time of Jesus John Stott describes Israel's relationship with the Lord in the time of Christ as a state of barely disguised hostility. Hostility. Is that too powerful a word? To, to think about God being hostile towards his creations? Is that something we even want to grasp? And you may say, well, that seems like uh, that's laying on a little thick. Preacher, are you sure? Well, if you turn to Matthew chapter 21, there's the, the powerful uh, parable of the tenants. I'm just going to kind of summarize it for you. There's the landowner that decides to build a vineyard. And so he starts planting the, these bushes, and he cultivates the land, and it's a wonderful vineyard complete with a wine press. Uh, I don't know why they would need that. but anyway, So he has this wine press, and he builds this stone wall around it, even provides a watchtower so they could see threats coming from away. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go off on a journey. I need someone to watch over this. So some of the local farmers are like, hey, I'll, we'll come and do that. He goes, okay, here's our agreement. You'll tend to what I've created. I'm going to put you in charge of this. And come harvest time, I'll send in someone to collect my portion of what you've done during this growing season, okay? He goes off to the far country. Sure enough, for harvest time, he sends back a servant. He says, uh, my, my master's ready for his portion. What do they do? They beat him up, okay? They, they take him out. So he sends another servant. They kill him. Third one, they stone him. And so he goes, well, well maybe it's the messengers who I'm sending. So I'll send my, my only son back. And of course, they kill the son as well. So this is kind of where we are in our relationship with God. In Matthew 21 and verse 40, it says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with these tenants? Well, if you're one of God's people listening to this, and you know you've been called, you know you know God, you have an understanding of him, you've also been blessed by God, how are you feeling right now as one of God's tenants, as Jesus tells the story? There's this hostility that's growing among God and his people. Here they have the bounty from the harvest, and they have not returned it to God. Wait, I, I thought this lesson was supposed to be about making us feel more at ease with God, uh, more at peace. Well, here's a few points for us. Number one, we have our origin in the creation, not the fall. Genesis 1 and verse 27 said that we have been created in the image of God, both male and female. And that, that's like no other thing that he's put on the face of the earth. We are unique. He's also blessed us in a different way. He's blessed humanity like no other creation. So God, God's starting point for us is in the garden. It's not in the fall. A lot of people will tell you we're defined by the fall. I say we're defined by the creation. What God has done, God desires a relationship like he had with Adam. And that goodness is there from the very beginning. Sure, sin and brokenness have changed this world in Genesis chapter 3. But we have to remember what God's starting point is for us. I think a lot of times when I've worked with, with families that have had friction in the teenage year, young adults, and, and there's a divide there, a lot of times you talk with a teen or you talk with a young adult that, that's gone off, he thinks that he's defined by that, those difficult years where mom and dad weren't getting along with this person. And I keep going back to the story of the prodigal son. That may be what you have defined this relationship, but God remembers the time from the very beginning. 
just like parents who remember those times of, of shaping and growing and the time to get her as a family as an infant all the way through. So that's where our origin is, in the creation, not in the fall. So it becomes incumbent upon us to discover this essence, to discover our, on our spiritual journey God's image that he's put within us. Number two, God's desire for peace and reconciliation has been constant. A lot of times we, we think, well, this is just kind of a New Testament thing but we could have a whole sermon series on what God has done to bless his people, also to forgive his people and show grace and bring them back. Hebrews chapter 7 tells an interesting story of Abram. And you remember we talked a few weeks ago about how Abram was called to go to the land that God would show him. And so he, he packs up his wife, but also his, his nephew Lot. And over the years, their wealth grew and it got to the point where it wasn't manageable for the two households to stay together and so lot chooses to go to the well-watered plains to the east while abraham stays to the west and and the text tells us that he puts his tents down next to sodom but then we get an update a few chapters later that well in fact he was living inside of sodom so there were some rebel kings that got together and went and took over Sodom and Gomorrah and have taken them off and along with the plunder is Lot and his family. So Abram gets word and he says, boys, let's strap on our swords. And so they go out and they ride into battle and go and rescue Lot and his family. And as they're coming back, the king of Sodom's like, well, I, I guess we could give you a, a portion of, of some of the things that you helped save. He goes, no, 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 I want to be only blessed by God. And so as he's walking across this valley to return home, weary from battle, this strange person shows up out of nowhere, a man by the name of Melchizedek. We don't know anything about him, where he came from, and we don't know what happened to him after, but he's referenced here in Hebrews chapter 7. Melchizedek was the king of Salem, but he's also a priest of God, so he kind of pulls these two roles together. And it says that he shows up, and he offers some bread and some wine to Abram out there on the field. So as they're kind of communing and sitting down, he says, I have a message from God. I want to bless you as God's representative. So this is an incredible thing. What the Hebrew writer says is, guess what? Jesus is cut from the same cloth as Melchizedek. He says, we need to go back. What does that mean? Well, Melchizedek is, means righteousness. And then we see the Salem means peace. So Jesus is our king of righteousness and our king of peace. So we need to pull these things together. So we see what God has been up to. And in sending Jesus, he showed us not only righteousness, but also to bring about this peace. The final point is God's peace for us was secured in Jesus Christ. If you remember the story of the birth of Jesus, you have the shepherds that are out there. I imagine it's kind of cold. They're out on the, uh, on the hillside, and they're tending to their flocks. When the, the Lord's messenger comes and talks to them, and says, Behold, they're in Bethlehem. The, the city of David, a child has been born. You need to go and see what God is up to. You can't miss him. He's the only one wrapped in these cloths lying in a manger. That'll be a sign to you. Go into the city and see what's happening. Right after this, it said, up over the horizon, you can almost see him rising up above him. It says a whole heavenly host joins in and starts singing praises to God. And what else? Peace on earth is happening. This friction is about to be done away with. This separation, God is going to be doing something incredible, showing that he is bringing peace to man on earth. Seven days later in the temple, you have Joseph and Mary, and, and they're carrying their young son in to be circumcised. So they've got baby Jesus with them. Well, there happened to be a gentleman in Jerusalem that had been waiting for a long time saying, Lord, just please show me what your plan is. And so it said he was led by the Spirit to walk into the temple, and he sees Joseph and Mary and says, I've got to hold this child. Okay, you know, I'm from God. Oh, okay. So they pass him over. He holds up and he says, Behold, Lord, I'm at peace. I can go. You can take me home. I see what you're up to. This is the Messiah. This is the child of promise. I'm at peace. My soul can rest. I'm right with God, knowing that he's going to be bringing this peace through this child. Well, fast forward 
all the way through Jesus' life and his death on the cross and his resurrection. The first time that he gathers together with the people, it said that he, he joins them in a room at night where they're having some dinner. They got the door locked. Imagine in hushed tones they're talking. They're like, we don't want the Jews to find us because there's no telling what they're going to do. Suddenly it says Jesus was there in their midst. Let's see what happens. In John chapter 20 and verse 19, Jesus came and stood among them. What, what would he say to them? Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the, the Lord. And I imagine they're asking the question, what was it like in the tomb? Lord, is it really you or is it just kind of a ghost? And they're talking about all, what does this mean for us? And what are we supposed to do next? Jesus stops them and says, peace be with you. So the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. He's like, don't you understand what this means? Not only have I conquered death, we're at peace with God. The, the, the table's been set. We can now commune with Him like Adam and Eve once did. Don't you understand the significance of this? If you do, allow the Spirit to guide us. What it says next, the Spirit's going to go. I want you to go and share your faith. Tell people their sins have been forgiven as well. They're at peace with God. That becomes the dominant message in everything that we see from this point forward. They're talking. They're saying, we're the people defined by peace. Let me tell you what that peace means to you in your life if you come to the Lord through Jesus Christ. Such a powerful message. What about us? I hope this morning as we go forth, we will embrace our identity as a people at peace with God. If we're a fearful people, ultimately it damages us personally and relationally. But here's something else that it does. It pulls a real power from the church. It makes us paralyzed to witness to those around us if we're fearful. If, if we don't feel that we're right with God, well, I, I kind of hope so. What message is that that we take out? People are looking for security. People are looking for people that are confident in the Lord to call them to. So we've got to embrace our identity as a people at peace with God in boldness we go forth. What does Hebrews 4 in verse 16 says? Approach the throne of grace with confidence. The curtain has been torn back. There's no priest that we have to go to. We can walk right into God's presence. We're called to be His priesthood, to spread the news, to be a holy people, crafted and designed by God to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. And we do that with boldness, knowing the peace that we have with God. The score has been settled. The next thing is we need to allow this peace to permeate all aspects of our life. Amen? We do. That needs to spill over into our relationships. We need to be at peace within our families. I know we're talking the holidays. Do your best. Okay, but that needs to spill out into every relationship. We need to be at peace, even though they're passing, or the rumor mill at work is they're going to pass out pink slips at the end of the year. That shouldn't rock our boat, should it? Because we know we have God by our side. We need to be a non-anxious presence, even when the doctor says, boy, you've got to come back for more tests. That shouldn't rattle our cage. We need to know that God is with us and God has a plan and we are at peace and at one with Him. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 16 says this, Now may the Lord of peace Himself give you peace at all times, in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Because of that, we have a peace that passes understanding, don't we? That's who we are as a people. This morning, if you're sitting there in the pew and you're thinking, that's not me. I've got a lot of turmoil in every aspect of my life. And the last thing I do is feel at ease. I don't sleep well at night. I've got anxiety. My, I've got stomach ulcers. I'm worried about this. And definitely in a relationship with God, I'm estranged. I, I don't feel good about that. Please, our shepherds will be right out here. Go find one of them. Our staff's available too. We'd love to sit down with you. We'd love to hear your story and and. and Share a, a prayer on your behalf. We want that to take place. We want you to get right with God. One more blessing, and the lesson is yours. The night before they were going to worship in the tabernacle for the first time, the people had, had built this, this structure.
for, for God to worship according to his standards. They had given generously to it. And you know there's a buzz in the camp that we're going to go for the first time and worship the Lord in this new tabernacle. So, you know, you guys remember when it was like coming back into the auditorium and I imagine for some of our charter members, the first Sunday you walked into this building. Well, that's what the Israelites are, are, are getting ready to experience. The Lord knows the excitement that's going to be coming forth. And he says, Moses, please go talk with Aaron, your brother, and his sons. And and as they are getting ready to to direct the worship service, I want you to tell him the message, the blessing that I have for him to share with the people. And it's a familiar passage. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord turns his face towards you to give you peace. This morning, the Lord is turning His face towards you. He's making eye contact. He wants you to be at peace. He wants you to be a people. Each one of us, they're defined by that peace that we have with Him. May we go out as a people blessed by this peace of the Lord.